being together as a family. Pray that you would bless us now as we hear from your word. And I ask you, Lord, to hear our special prayers. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Okay, special prayers are these. I'm going to ask you to pray this morning, hitting a pretty uh, big chapter, pretty intense. I'm going to blow through it really rapidly and get down to the application. But I'm going to ask you, because I've been doing this frequently, and I find that it helps me a lot if you'll do it, turn to somebody and pray out loud. You can whisper, you can pray out loud, whatever you want. And just ask the Lord to do these number of things. Number one, that His Spirit would speak through me and that my words would carry uh, the uh, life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's number one prayer. Don't forget it. So the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, that your hearts and minds would be open to hear, having ears to hear and, and eyes to see, that kind of a thing, that you could understand what is being said and accept the challenges that come. And then the third thing that you might cover is the revival, that I am praying for revival in our church. So if you would just take a few moments, I'll give you 30, 40 seconds to pray that, then I'll close this, and then we'll begin with the sermon. Fair enough? So turn to somebody right away and begin praying. Father, we thank you for this day, the opportunity to hear from you. We've given you our hearts in worship. We surrender our lives to you the best we know. But now, Father, we ask you to speak to us, that we might understand you better, <clears throat> that we might comprehend what it is that you ask of us and offer to us. Be with me as I teach and preach that the word of God would go forth with clarity and on the wings of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> that it would change and transform each of our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hang on a minute. <clears throat> I think I'm clear. Anyway, as we begin, uh, a number of things uh, that I want to do. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about chapter 18 here in a moment. Uh, this came out actually in the middle of my sermon, but I want to bring it out the first now because all of this is going gonna, is gonna to fit together. And I don't know how to tell you how it fits together, except that... Uh, you'll see it as, it as it comes to light to you. And uh, before I can begin, I didn't do this in the first service, I did it right in the middle, but I'm going to do it now. Uh, I'm going to wait. I think it'll fit better later. I'll wait. And I'll tell you when it is when I get there. So let's just start. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we've been working through the book of Revelation, and we're working now in chapter 18. I'm going to cover the entire chapter in one message because I'm going to hit with it the highlights. There's a lot of information in here and it talks about the demise of the economic Babylon so we don't need all those details unless you want to go home and read them but I will give you the highlights so that you can understand where I believe God is leading us. So if you haven't been with us throughout this whole series let me just give a real quick recap of all the things we have learned starting from Revelation chapter 1. And what we have found, and I'm going to give it, this was very general. This is not all the details, like a total outline. This is a bullet point outline to catch us up to chapter 18. What we have learned thus far from the book of Revelation and what we have discovered and seen is, number one, a major event is the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. The next thing that we saw in all of this relationship were the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath. And as we come to the end of this thing, Revelation chapter 18 and chapter 17 are what we would call the wind down. They are the fulfillment, the culmination of the end of the Great Tribulation and the introduction and return of Jesus Christ physically to the earth. So we come to this seeing the last bowl of the wrath of God being released upon mankind. 
in this process preceding it, we've seen the 144,000 what we believe to be Jewish evangelists who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, who are protected by God and the Holy Spirit throughout the remainder of the tribulation, and they are, are, are sharing the gospel in mighty ways, and we see that multitudes, it says in the scripture, come to Christ, both Gentile and Jew. So we've seen the 144,000. Then we saw also at this same time the rising of the Antichrist, the one who is the Antichrist, not one of Antichrists, but the Antichrist, the one who will become the world dictator and who will rule this world uh, under his thumb and under his power. And then we saw with him he will make a covenant with Israel, and it's supposed to be for seven years, but in the middle, somewhere along the way, he will break that covenant and war will break out, and then we will see the second half of the Great Tribulation as it begins to unfold. During the process of time in that whole thing, and we don't know exactly where, we don't give it dates and times, nor do we give it specifics within that seven-year period, but somewhere in there, he rises up to fulfill his ultimate goal, which is to be worshipped as God. And to do so, we read last, not last week, the week before last in chapter 17, that the Antichrist literally rises up against the harlot church. That's what I call it. The apostate church that is, is there, and it destroy, he destroys that church of that false prophet and judges them. In a sense, God uses him to destroy that on which he rode to power. But he wants to be declared as God, and the false church won't do that either. So now he destroys that, and he begins to declare himself that great God that he is not. And it is called the abomination of desolation. Stands in the temple at Jerusalem and says, I am God, worship me. So we see that beginning to happen. And during that whole process of time, there's been the religious Babylon, what we spoke of in chapter 17, and there is the economic Babylon. Today we're talking about the second aspect of the judgment on the Babylon the Great, and that is the economic judgment which comes upon it and then therefore impacts the entire world once again. And we see a great war breaking out called the War of Armageddon and then the Battle of Armageddon, which is at the end. And then we see whew, the physical return of Jesus Christ. And everybody says, hallelujah, amen. amen. That's the good stuff. We're going to get there in a couple of weeks. But for today, we're going to deal with the destruction of Babylon the Great hyphen economics. And that's what we're doing. So let's take a look first. I'll read a few verses and then comment. And then at the end, I will give you the application. Revelation 18, 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Now, that's quite an angel. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So what we see here is a description of this demonically inspired, this demonically empowered Antichrist and all that he represents having its power and its expression and its genius in a kind of a sad way, a, a, a negative genius to produce a world economy, and an economy that in those few months or few years that they will exist will bring unimaginable wealth and unimaginable luxury to all the people of the world that are worshiping at the foot of Satan. Now, the, the saints will not get that. We will be disenfranchised if we were here. I believe the church will be raptured out because we don't see the word church after Revelation 4, but we see the word saints. So the saints that are there at that time who have come to Christ through the ministry of the 144,000 will be disenfranchised, marginalized, and actually become martyrs and, and uh, persecuted believers during that period of time. But God is now coming to judge this world in the final stage. He's judged the harlot church. Now he comes and he makes this statement. It's an angelic proclamation. So if you're a note taker, that would be the first one to write down. The angelic proclamation. And he speaks of Babylon as having fallen, as though it has already occurred. That's, in a way, is called the prophetic past tense. 
In other words, the, when it's prophecy that is going to happen, but it hasn't yet happened, it still refers to it as past tense. That gives us an assurance, a confidence that it will occur. And as we live our lives and look at Scripture all the way from Genesis to Revelation, we can discover that all the things that God has prophesied have all come true. So we should probably believe this one as well. Amen? So it comes and it says that Babylon has fallen, that there is going to be a description here, and there is a description, talking about it basically being infested with demons. It says every demon, every foul spirit, every, every unclean bird is in it like in a cage. Now I will tell you that they won't think that. This is going to be the pride of man at its fullest orb, expressing itself in rejection of God and an unrepentant spirit as a whole of humanity. And it's going to feel that it's free and it's wonderful, just as we see in our culture today. But God says, no, it's basically in a cage. This is saying that God is in control. And when God is ready, he'll squash it. He'll deal with it. And it will take place. And then he speaks in this passage that this, this uh, destruction of Babylon, economic Babylon, which is to come, is, is also bringing with it all of the kings of the earth, all of the nations will essentially be bowing down to this economic juggernaut. And they will all be making themselves wealthy and rich and comfortable by those things which are there. And when God refers to it, he refers to it as they are committing fornication. In other words, they are having illicit relationship within the mystery religions of Babylon in order to live in the luxury that it can provide. Now there's a warning here for us as believers that we too can be swept away without any knowledge of it inside the context of the culture in which we dwell. And our culture is shifting. Can we all agree on that? Amen. What we see today, which is accepted, is unbelievably strange to me from my culture in my day of nearly 70 years ago. When I look at this and I see what we do today and we don't call it out for what it is, we don't call it for sin. We don't call it for debauchery. We just say, well, it's okay. That troubles me because I've known our culture before that time. I've lived long enough to see our culture begin to shift starting right after World War II and taking a major shift in the 60s with the love revolution and the peace revolution, all of those things. They've all begun to shift and to move and to create a, a capacity in us to accept certain kinds of things as normal and no longer call them what they are, not in judgment, but in warning that these things are sin. We have to be very, very careful, saints. And I'm going to talk a great deal about this in a few moments. But for now, I'm just giving you a basic outline of what's taking place. Now go back to Revelation 18 and pick it up with me at verse 4 and verse 5. This is what we call the exhortation. We've had the proclamation that, that uh, Babylon the Great is about to fall and it's going to send us into a world depression. Then we have the exhortation from Jesus to his saints, to the believers. And this exhortation is a word which means a warning. Listen to what he says. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now who could call us his people but Jesus? So this isn't an angel. This is Jesus himself. He's calling out to my people, lest you share in her sins. In other words, unless you behave as she behaves, lest you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. This is an exhortation to come out. When I first read this in the English, what I thought of was the come out means the called out, the ecclesia, another Greek word that means the called out ones. But I got to thinking, that's not what this is saying. So I dug it around in the Greek and it's another word which I don't even bother to try and pronounce. But what it is, is the word escape. And what Jesus is saying to the saints of that day and time, which if we're truly in the church and we're raptured out, we won't face it, but we can learn from it. He's saying, listen, come out of the sins of Babylon. Get thee out of there. Escape before the judgment comes. This word escape is the same idea that was spoken of in Genesis chapter 19 when the two angels come and they speak to Lot and they say, Get your family, those of your household, and get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Escape the wrath, the judgment to come. And what we see there is he resists it at first. Finally he goes, he takes his family, and as they're running off, the hail and the fire, and this, all this destruction is falling upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happens? His wife turns and looks back and becomes a pillar of salt. 
Not a good idea. But you see, I think sometimes as Christians, when we do that, I think maybe a better example or another example would be the story of the Israelites when they left Egypt. And they were always longing for going back to Egypt. Let's go back and have some more cucumbers and some garlic and some leeks. Just not my most favorite meal, amen? <laughs> but you see, they were going back to what they knew. To them, that was comfortable. They were willing to go back. Lot's wife was missing, in my opinion, the comfort that she knew, the life that she understood, and she had been swept away in a city that was filled with Sodom and Gomorrah, the idea of sodomy, the whole idea of this homosexual lifestyle. She was willing to live in the midst of that rather than take the risk of going forward into the unknown with God. Amen? The message here is that we need to be a people who do not look back. The scripture teaches us in another section in one of Jesus' gospel messages that he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom of God. And I suspect at the end of this message, you'll hear it very strongly from me, that many of us have chosen to look back, to almost, if you will, go back and long for the days before we were called into Christ and really committed to that kind of a lifestyle. And that kind of a radical change, that kind of a transformation, what we call today the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is warning his saints. He's saying, get out of her. Escape this mentality. Escape this way of thinking. Escape this culture. Although you may be in the world, you are not of the world. You are to be different. Saints, we are to be different not because we make ourselves different, although there's a piece of that, but because Jesus Christ has brought us into his bride and we are part of who he is and will become one in a fullness we've never understood, even here on the earth, but definitely in heaven. So we're called to be <clears throat> separate. We are called to escape all of these things. And the nations have, as it said, committed fornication with this Babylon the Great, giving up their integrity, giving up the truth and, and reality of a, of a biblical faith in order to become wealthy and to live in luxury. And then Jesus comes and don't settle for that. It's worth nothing. There's nothing more important in any human life than the kingdom of the living God. And Jesus is here it, 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 exhorting them, warning them, come out. And he's saying the same to us today. Don't look back, because you see, Jesus is coming for a glorious church. We can read that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. It says that he is coming for a glorious church without spot or blemish or without wrinkle. Now, we do get wrinkles. I know this, okay. But we're not supposed to be wrinkled as the church. We're to be a glorious, beautiful bride of Jesus. Now, I know for men that's a strange concept for us but what it's saying is is that we are to be a people as men and as women separated unto God walking in holiness and righteousness and in the glory of God himself and you see <clears throat> this idea of walking in holiness has really been given a bad rap this holy idea of holiness has been well you know you you've, you've got to come to church looking really ugly and and you can't do your hair nice and you can't shave and you can't this and you can't that and you can't dress nice and you got to wear your clothes to here and you got to be extremely uh, uh, overly 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 modest and this is to prove that you are godly so i walk this way because i'm godly i want to tell you what the definition of being holy is holy is knowing God and not just being born again holiness is walking in personal relationship with God on a daily basis pursuing the holiness without which no man shall see God that's what holiness is holiness is not about the way you dress or, or, or how pruny you look holiness is do you know Jesus have you met with him and do you meet with him? Do you take time to know his word? Because in this word is the expression of the character of God. This word is not about scholasticism, although we may do that. We may understand it from an intellectual and scholastic point of view, but if you miss it as to revealing the character of God and the relationship that he offers you, 
You've missed it. You can know all things. You can be Martin Luther. You can be Zwingli and all these great reformers. That's fantastic. You can be a John MacArthur. But if you don't know the character of God and experience the character, you're going to miss exactly what Jesus is saying here. Because you see, when you know the character of Christ and he has inculcated himself, he has permeated you with himself, you will leave sin. You will forsake sin. It is not so much running from sin as it is running to God. That's how you do it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Escape this trash. Escape what's about to happen to this culture and run to me. Come to me and I will make you holy. Come to me and I will show you what real life is all about. And it's not possessions. It's not luxury. It's not wealth. It's not riches. It's not belonging to the elite. It's belonging to elite, to Jesus Christ, the elite of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all that we have and see. That's what we are to be about. So Jesus, in his exhortation, is saying, come out of these sins. Come out of this lifestyle. Escape from the culture that you dwell in and make your own culture in the kingdom of God. That's what we need as believers. That's what we, believe, what we need as a church, is to be a kingdom culture. Have you thought about that? Have you ever considered that? I know I've shared it with you once or twice over the many years. We are supposed to be a different people. We are to create a kingdom culture because we are all walking in the Spirit with Jesus Christ, obedient to Him. Amen? Amen. Do you really mean that? A kingdom culture that shares our lives, our situations, our needs, our concerns, our failures with each other. It's very important that we understand that. We'll talk about sharing failures for a moment. Now, this is where it's going to come in. Remember I told you it would come in later. I never know when. I might have completely forgotten it. But one of the things that I think is missing in the church today is a sincere and honest confession of sin. I'll talk a bit more about that in a little bit. But I want to share with you today that I have put into my prayer life, always have, and lately it's been even more, a confession of sin. Where have I sinned against God? How have I grieved the Holy Spirit? And I take it very, very seriously. So even the smallest sin does not escape my view if I can help it. If I find that I've committed a sin unknowingly, I will confess it immediately before the Lord. And if it involves another person, I'll confess it to them. Last night. I had to go to bed. Before I could go to bed, I had to confess to my son. I spoke sharply to him. Something that was a wound in me came out at him, and I had to go before I could go to bed, before I could put him to bed, I had to say, son, I need to ask your forgiveness. I wanted to make it clear because I wanted to be right with God. The byproduct of that is that I can preach well to you because I'm clear. But we have forgotten the art the necessity of the confession of our sin. If you want a revival in your life and it isn't coming, I can almost guarantee that it's because you are not dealing with the sin in your lives because we've been swept away in the culture and what was sin for us 50 years ago is no longer called that. We're calling that which is good evil and that which is evil good and we're accepting it. We should not accept these things. We are to be a kingdom people, living in a kingdom culture and having a kingdom worldview. Amen? And that worldview is Jesus. We don't need to be ashamed. We don't need to be embarrassed. We don't need to be rude and crude and socially unacceptable. But we need to be in love with the Lord and give ourselves to him fully. It's radically important for us saints. And so Jesus is exhorting. We've got the proclamation, judgment's coming. Jesus is giving the exhortation, escape while you can. Be the church that God has made you to be. And then we see, as it were, the last big thing, the annihilation that's going to be brought upon economic Babylon. And it will be brought upon it by God. Why is this? Because the economic Babylon is a representation of all the rejection of mankind. And they've said, see, we don't need God. 
We have our luxury. We have our cars. We have our houses. We have our wealth. And oh yeah, we know about these believers over here, these Jews and the Gentiles. But you know, they don't count. We're good with God. We're good with everything because we got all that we need. We must be right. And we'll worship the devil. That's what they're saying. And God is saying that ain't going to work. It ain't going to wash. And he's going to bring economic devastation to the world. We've seen the depressions. Amen? How many of you here grew up with parents that had been through the Great Depression? If you haven't been through that with your parents, you have no idea what it was like. I've heard the stories. I've seen the results and the emotional scarring and struggles, and yet the strength that underlies some of those people who lived through that. How many of you remember this downturn in our economy around 2008, 2009? A lot of us lost a lot in our retirement funds and so on. So I, I lost mine entirely. Praise the Lord that I didn't have to worry about it anymore. You know, I, it's gone <laughs> vaporized. That's all right. In a day, it was gone. And that's what it says in this passage, that God will take down economic Babylon in one day. Not just a day. He'll do it in one hour. It's mentioned four times in this particular chapter. What is that telling us? It's telling us that when God brings economic devastation, it's going to cover the whole world. And when economic de uh, de devastation comes, it brings depression, and depression is followed by emotional depression. People will not be able to buy or sell, and it says that it will all be destroyed in a moment, and it'll literally the merchants will set off in their ships and be afraid to come near it, and they'll see it all going up in smoke. I guess that's where the phrase comes from. Well, it all went up in smoke. You know? It's true. What we have on this earth can go up in smoke like that. It can be vaporized like that. It's just the way it is. So what does that tell us? It tells us that our interests, our motivations, our priorities are not to be here, but they are to be in the kingdom of God. Everybody say with me, kingdom. kingdom. Remember that. Your priorities are to be in the kingdom and in his king or its king who is Jesus Christ the Lord. So, then he goes on in verse 24, I'll tell you this, and I'll go to the application. Verse 24 tells us that the reason all of this has come is that God is fulfilling that which he had promised to the martyrs under the altar way back in the early part of Revelation. When will you avenge us? When will you make justice? And God says, just wait a little while, it's coming. And when it comes, it's complete. And economic Babylon and the economic situation of this world will come to a dead stop. And all will be lost, other than those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. Even if you're persecuted for Jesus, you gain. Even if you are martyred for Jesus Christ, you double gain, because you'll be under the very altar of God. There's some amazing things that God is teaching us. So let's listen now. What, is it, what am I trying to get across in this message as I close out? The first part, the, the proclamation is, that it will fall. We need to know that. God is in charge, and this was all going to fall. Everything you own, everything you want to own, everything you possess, everything you, you desire that is not of God will be vaporized. It will be gone at some point in the future. And while we live in a culture that is moving further and further and further away from God, we are to, as it were, escape that culture. And it is going to make you look differently. It is going to make you think differently, and it is going to change the way people respond to you. Some will hate you for your love for God, and some will love you. Some will leave you behind, and some will love you and be drawn to you because they will see that there is a greater hope, there is a greater purpose, there is a greater plan than just this world. And we need to be a people, kingdom people, who have our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, who have our eyes fixed with confidence upon an eternity which he has bought for us and will give to us. This life is really quite short, amen? It doesn't last long, but in this life we have the opportunity to make the right choice or the wrong choice, and there really are only two. There's a choice for God and the choice for everything else, and you don't want the everything else. So first of all, we are admonished here to know that the judgment is coming. Secondly, we are exhorted to escape that judgment. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, and then we'll turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 2, verse 3 says, Every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape? Say the word escape. How shall we escape if we neglect 
so great a salvation. Now that can be interpreted two ways. The first way and the most common way is that people get saved. That's good and that's necessary. But another aspect of this translation and interpretation of this passage is that once we have the salvation, we can't neglect to live as though we are saved. That we become a people of God. That we don't just get saved and sit in the chair or, or do whatever and have no change in our lives whatsoever. Saints, we are to be changing. We are to be continually being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are continually to be transformed by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in Romans, he says, once you yielded yourselves to slaves, uh, to sin, as slaves of sin, now yield yourselves unto God for sanctification. That word sanctification translated there in Romans is yield yourselves to God for holiness. Not something that's static. Holiness is not static. It moves, it changes, and it grows in you and me. But we must cooperate with that. So we can't neglect the two sides of our salvation, that which is a free gift to us and that which is a sanctifying work which we are to cooperate in. And we are to do something else with that. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I know I'm hitting you hard, but by golly, I just have to tell the truth from the scripture, so that's what I'm going to do. Amen. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, now look at this, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He says, lay aside every weight and the sin that holds us back. And what I'm saying this morning and what I believe God wants you to hear, and it could thin out the church, I don't know. But that's not my concern. It crosses my mind. But I have to speak truth. God is looking for a bride. And he's looking for a bride that is without spot or blemish or wrinkle. What is he saying there? He's saying to you and to me that we need to be a people who understand that sin separates us from God. Now, you may be saved and still sin. There's no question that that happens. But what God really wants us to do is to forsake sin as we see it and know it as it is revealed to us to confess that to him so that we will not be grieving, quenching, nor lying to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. If you grieve the Spirit by your sin, you cannot walk in the power of the Spirit. We have to have clean books before the Lord, clean every day, every moment. That's why I was telling you the story about confessing to my son. I want to be able to walk in fellowship with God and to walk in the experience of an ever-growing holiness. And that holiness does not make me look like I've been weaned on a pickle. It doesn't make me be a man without a, 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 humor, a sense of humor. The people who work down here with me throughout the week will tell you, uh, I've got a sense of humor. It's kind of different, but it's there. And, and I'm always running around whistling and singing and doing all of these things. The holiness is not just kneeling down and, and, and cloistering myself away and being present with God. It's taking God with me and following God wherever he goes. Amen. In a real relationship, that's holiness. It's attractive. I tell young men all the time, if you really want to be attractive to some of these young ladies in the church, be a godly man. You watch what will happen. They'll go to you. Husbands, you want to have your wife fall in love with you all over again. Be a godly man. Be a holy man in the truth of holiness. You'll become like Jesus and she will fall in love with you. Women, it works the same way for you. Be a woman like Mary that followed Jesus Christ or any of the ladies who followed him. Be that and watch what happens with you and your husband. It really works. It really does. But you have to pursue this holiness. You have to be one who separates yourself from sin. He says, lay aside everything. Uh, weight and sin that besets you. Lay it aside. We're all walking along in this culture and accepting things that we should never even think of. I think just a simple list of the Ten Commandments is real good for finding out what you need to do. You know, here's the first one with the promise, and it's, it's a big one. Number four, children, obey your parents and the Lord. For this is the first promise 
or the first commandment with a promise that you will live well and long in the land. We see today young people rejecting their parents and rejecting anything healthy or traditional and going after the world. God help you, young people. If you can't see the sense in the scripture to obey your parents and to love them in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got a major problem. And that rebellion expressed to your parents, I, I didn't know I was going to say this, but here I go. But that rebellion expressed to your parents is a rebellion against God. It's a rebellion against the ways of God. It takes you right back to the garden and you become Adam and or Eve as you reject the way of God. I want you to understand this, church. We are to be a clean church. We're to leave aside. We're not to commit adultery. We're not to commit murder. We're not to lie. We're not to steal. We're not to covet. Does that cover anybody in this room? Those are the issues of our faith. And we settle for this. We put things in front of our faces we should never look at. We take second glances at men and or at women that we should never take the second glance. We think thoughts of vengeance and anger and hatred and getting even and bitterness. All of this should be gone. The way it is said in my mind is that if I have any complaint about anything that happens to me because of another person, it tells me that I am not yet dead, that my old man is still rising up. That's what happened last night, and I had to confess it to my son. I thank God that I did. But you see, we are to be a clean people. That doesn't mean we're not fun to be with. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy all the things that God has given to us. Oh, my gosh. Think of what he did for Adam and Eve. He put them in the garden. He gave them everything. He got it all ready, all put together like Christmas and said, here, it's yours. But they wanted it their way. Don't do that. We need to forsake sin. Because it is a cancer. It is a destructive force in your life and in your relationship with Jesus. And what the fear for me is for all of the church is that sometimes we, we think, well, I'm saved. And, you know, that's just a little sin. I, I can get by with that. And I know I'm going to go to heaven. But, but I'm not going to take sin in my life seriously. Saints, if you want revival, you've got to take sin seriously. If you, if you want revival, you can't live in little white lies. Because a white lie is as black as a black lie to the good and loving God that we serve. If you have relationships that are askew, you need to do what you can to fix them. Some cannot be fixed because the other side won't work with you. I understand that. Been through that many times in my life. Still being through it. But as far as I am concerned, I have to do what is right in God's eyes for me and leave the consequences to God. But we as a church, and you as an individual, and we as the church of the world today that God is going to receive unto himself, we need to separate ourselves from sin. And when we do, we stand out. And strangely enough, people will respect you for that. Some will make fun of you. Some will mock you. I understand that. But what is that compared to eternity with Jesus Christ? So we need to be that people that understand that sin separates us. And we need to separate ourselves from sin and not be foolish. Because you see, there is a time when we get to a place where we are so swept away in the sin that we are in, we can no longer see it. Proverbs 29 verse 1 says that uh, he who is often reproved and hardeneth or stiffeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. That's the King James. That's the way I learned it. What it's meaning is, is someone who is told over and over and over again, escape sin, get away from that, leave that alone, but hardens their heart, says neck in that, but it means hardens their heart, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, destruction will come. I tell you, saints, it doesn't even need God to do that. It's just part of the way the universe was put together. It is a moral universe. And God is calling you and me and his church to escape sin. And not just to escape it like I'm saved because I came to Jesus, but to escape the, the, the remaining residue of it that resides in you and pursue consciously holiness with God. And this requires confession. There's many lists of sin in the scripture. 
It even talks about the tongue and the things that we say and do. Just all kinds of things. And I'm urging you today to become a Christian that says, Lord, make me sensitive to the sin in my life that I can escape the culture of sin and come into the culture of the kingdom of God. Help me not to sell out for riches or for security as the world shows me, but help me to sell out for your kingdom, to put my trust in you, not to trust in my own uh, means or my own capacities, but to put my trust in you. That's what God is looking for. When he says he wants a bride, a holy and righteous bride, he's talking about a bride that is waiting for the coming of the groom. He's talking about one who's making herself ready. And then we've lived in foreign lands where the custom is the girls getting ready for nearly a year. Can you imagine? I think of the story of, of Esther, Queen Esther. And she was preparing and getting ready, and getting all in shape and all that to be the most beautiful expression of, of womanhood that the king would ever see. That's what God is saying to the church. He wants us to be the most beautiful expression of living holiness so that when he comes and he calls us to himself, we go without fear, without condemnation, and without hesitation. So the reality is, is this. You have to decide. This is not as much an evangelistic message, though it could be. This is a message of revival. This is a message of will you make the decision to say, Lord God, I will become a confessor. I will bring to you anything and everything that I see in my heart which you reveal or that someone else reveals or that I stumble upon by myself. And I will be grieved to see that I have sinned against you. And I will come to you and say, Oh Lord God, I thank you for your mercy. Forgive me now. And release me into your kingdom in the full power of the Holy Spirit. That's revival. That is a living, conscious, working, beautiful holiness that God has called his church to. Brothers and sisters, he's asking you, he's exhorting you in his greatest love to escape. Don't settle for sins. Whatever they are, you say, well, I'll get rid of that later. Get rid of it now. Amen. Confess it today. And you may say, well, I, I don't know if I can beat it. Well, I can guarantee you if you don't confess it, you can't. But if you'll confess it and you mean it in your heart, God will begin to work and show you a way through that. He will give you what you need. The scripture is very clear that if we face any temptation, if we call upon God who is able, he will come and show us a way out. But we have to acknowledge it and confess it first. And then we become a living, walking, holy sanctuary unto the living God. Amen? I pray that you will not take this message and go out and think, well, that was challenging and interesting. My heart's desire is that you will take this message somewhere today or this evening before you go to bed or whenever you need to do this, but soon. And kneel down or sit down or lay down or however it is that you pray before the Lord. And say, God, I may have heard a lot of messages in my life, but this one has the capacity to change me. I want to be your kingdom subject. I want to surrender my life in all of it to you. I will guarantee you, saints, that there is a broad and wonderful way set out before those who've trusted Christ and have put their faith in him in a real living faith to say, I no longer want the things of the world. I trade them in for Jesus Christ. Father, Lord, you know. You know the heart of every person here, and you know, Lord, if anything that's been said has gotten to a heart. But if even one or ten or a hundred, or all, Lord, could hear your voice in what I've said today and hear you calling out to them, escape the sin. Separate yourselves from the world and unto me. I pray you would call them to be willing, Lord, to, to trust you, 
to become confessors of sin and to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, they would not go from here and forget this. I pray that you would needle them, press them, call them, push them, Father, convict them, that they would say, I have these things in my life that have to go. I don't know what the sin may be. It might be any one of the Ten Commandments. It might be unforgiveness and bitterness. I don't know, Lord. But I know that we all face these things. And I'm asking you, Lord God, that they would focus on Jesus and living for him and not for themselves. I ask this, O God, to your glory and to their blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Please, please consider these things.